This is a podcast from the Nuffield Department of Medicine. Today we spoke to Dr Catherine Green about her research on DNA replication and cancer. Hello Catherine. Hi. Can you tell us what can go wrong when DNA is replicated? I guess we've all become familiar these days with the structure of the DNA helix, how two strands of DNA intertwine around each other in this twisted ladder structure with each strand being made up of the four bases A, G, C and T. So that structure leads, of course, to the mechanism by which DNA can be replicated or copied. The two strands can separate from each other and each strand can be used as a template for the synthesis of two identical strands. This process is essential in cells because cells are forever needing to copy themselves to produce daughter cells to replenish cells which are lost during everyday life. What causes genome instability? Genome instability can arise during DNA replication in many, many different ways. The enzymes and the machinery that's used by cells to perform DNA replication to copy our DNA is not 100% accurate. Most of the time, those mistakes made by the DNA replication machinery will be picked up and corrected before they become mutations. But even these surveillance processes are not 100% accurate. However, there are some lifestyle choices that we make that can increase the chance that DNA replication leads to genome instability. For example, when we go outside in the sunshine, if we lie in a sunbed in particular, we expose the cells of our skin to ultraviolet radiation. And ultraviolet light is very harmful to the DNA in those cells because the energy of ultraviolet light is absorbed by DNA and causes a chemical change. Similar changes and similar genome instability can arise due to chemicals in tobacco, smoke, or in other environmental carcinogens. How can genome instability lead to the development of cancer? Some changes to our genome, some mutations, will have a very limited effect. DNA changes that change a single base in a region of the genome that's not being used, for example, might not have any consequence at all to cells. But sometimes a single base change in our genome can have a serious effect if that single base change inactivates a gene which is required for a surveillance pathway that prevents cancer or a DNA repair mechanism that ensures that our genomes are okay and maintained healthily. Another way that genome instability can cause cancer is by causing genome rearrangements. During the process of DNA replication, breaks may happen to the DNA, and those breaks have to be joined back together again. But if pieces of DNA which are in linear space are joined back together erroneously, you can move around pieces of the genome relative to each other. Now, because our genome is made up of pieces of DNA which regulate other pieces of DNA, such genome rearrangements can mean that genes, although they're still normal genes, unmutated genes, are moved into parts of the genome where their regulation is perturbed. And that can lead to perturbed cell functions, which then can generate tumorigenesis. What are the most important lines of research that have developed in the past five or ten years? For me, I think there have probably been three step changes in our understanding of genomes and how genome instability contributes to cancer. The first is probably just the scale of genome instability that underpins the cancer development. Recent developments in sequencing technologies mean that we can now analyse what's happened in cancer cells compared to normal cells in the same individual. And there are hundreds and thousands of changes in cancer cells relative to normal cells in our body. So one of the big challenges now is to start to dissect out which of those changes are the causing changes, the, the mutations which have the consequences for the cell that result in cancer, and those which are just passengers, mutations which have arised, but which are, are of not functional consequence for the cells. The second change, I think, is that we know more and more about how the fact that cancer cells are undergoing such genome instability means that they have adapted to cope with that. Cancer cells have often become dependent upon specific pathways that enable them to cope with genome instability that normal cells of the body don't require most of the time. This might give us a really good therapeutic window if we can target those pathways that cancer cells rely on, we might be able to kill those while the normal cells, because they don't rely on these pathways to cope with genome instability, are untouched by those treatments. And the third aspect of cell biology that I think we really know more about now is the three-dimensional structure of the nucleus. We now appreciate much more that although genes are arranged in linear fashion on DNA molecules, in the nucleus they're folded up in three-dimensional organisation. And that means that pieces of DNA which are far apart in linear space can be close together and regulate each other in three-dimensional space. And I think this can influence cell behaviour in ways that we are only really beginning to understand. Why does your line of research matter and why should we put money into it? 
because of its contribution to genome and instability, I think that understanding the process of DNA replication is fundamentally important. If we can understand how these mutagenic processes occur, when they occur and why they occur, we might be able to devise in the future lifestyle interventions, treatments, alterations we can make to the way we live our lives that would help to reduce that mutational burden and reduce cancer formation. But that's a long-term goal for cancer um, understanding of cancer into the future. In the more immediate term, many, many of the chemotherapeutics in use in the cancer clinic today target the process of DNA replication directly. So they inhibit DNA replication because cancer cells tend to be proliferating very rapidly and are doing a lot of DNA replication. If you can stop that, you can stop the cancer from growing. But these drugs tend to have side effects. And if we understand more about the process of replication, how that process responds to these chemotherapeutic drugs, we might well be able to intervene in combination therapies or in better drug design to prevent some of these side effects while maintaining cancer killing effects. How does your research fit into translational medicine within the department? Most of the research that I and my group do would be classified as basic cellular research. We're trying to understand fundamental cell biology processes so that we can appreciate what's gone wrong when cancers develop, for example. Now, much of the understanding and development of cancer drugs in the last 10 years have come from a basic improvement in our understanding of fundamental cell biology. The more we know about these pathways, the more we can apply rational and targeted design of drugs and other interventions to intervene to stop cancers developing. As we identify new targets, new players in these fundamental processes, it will be very easy to bring those in combination with these huge resources available in Oxford to design and improve patient treatments in the future. Thank you very much.